that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. You catch that again? So Jesus again is saying, when you read back the Old Testament, when you read these, uh, when you read these Old Testament scriptures, that's great. My, my grandmother's dead. Um, you get to the Old Testament and you read and you start seeing about this coming king, right? Jesus interprets himself back into there. So when we're reading and we're thinking, uh, especially for those of you who are doing our Bible study plan, if you're reading long instructs in the Old Testament, and you start to see these kind of glimpses of who they talk about, right? We have to, any time that the Old Testament is kind of pointing towards the coming Messiah, it's talking about Jesus, right? This is, this is simple, but yeah, that's a big thing in the Old Testament, that there's a coming Messiah. Well, the other way you can phrase this is that there's a thing that that, are, that promises are being made. Okay, the New Testament will see that those promises are kept, and that's kind of how we uh, reconcile this. So, again, all the way back to Genesis, right, Jesus shows us that he's he's there in all of those Old Testament scriptures. So, as we're um, interpreting the Old Testament, uh, we have to interpret it through the lens of this coming Messiah. That is coming is going to be going to be Christ. Does that make sense? Now that might seem really basic, but it can change the way you interpret the Old Testament if you're looking for this if, rather than if you're not. So when you get to um, when you get to stories like David and Goliath, for instance, okay, and you know that there's a coming a coming Messiah, right? You can you can you start to read these stories about David, and you see that David is kind of this hero for Israel. Right. Defeats Goliath. Gets the stone. Gets Goliath. Defeats all the odds. Well, then you think, oh wow, David must be the guy. But then you read a couple chapters later, right? And he's you know, committing adultery and having uh, her husband killed. So we see that he falls short of this idea. So there's always this kind of longing for a coming Messiah. And we know that that is Christ. So that changes the way you interpret Right, David and Goliath, but it, it, it stops being, oh, well, you need to face your giants. Stand up to your giants and sling the rock, pick up your stone, and you'll be fine. But when you read through the lens of that there's a coming Messiah, you start to see that everywhere that in Israel that we see this kind of beginning of a, uh, of a hero, they always end up falling. Right? They always end up uh, falling short of what we think of them. And we know that's because obviously no one can. <clears throat> no one can uh, look at God's standards. So we're waiting for a coming of Cyber Does that make sense? Again, that's more of a, a, a great uh, lens by which to do the Old Testament. The second theme we see in the Old Testament is the theme of covenants. Flip over to Exodus chapter 19. And we're going to talk like the very most basic shallow discussion of covenants, right? So there are monster 9,000 page books on covenants that you want to read. Okay. But we're going to just break, we're going to basically break covenants up into two types. The first type we will see in Exodus 19 verses 4 through 6. Exodus 19, 4 through 6. You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians. Now I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you shall speak to the people of Israel. Okay, so here we see uh, an example of an Old Testament covenant. So let's break it up into parts. Okay? This is again where I want to tie this back into when we were making observations. Remember when we were making observations, we said we need to look for sin and structure. Right? So if, if you look at verse 5, we see an if then statement. Okay, we talked about if then statements. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasure possession. See that how there's a, it's not, it's not technically an if then statement, but there's, a, there's conditions. If you do this, then you will you will be this. All right? These are called conditional covenants. Basically, these covenants are uh, they have two parts. Basically, there's the 
God gives a responsibility, right? And that responsibility brings forth a result. So in this case, in Exodus 19, you see that if Israel will obey the voice, then there will be a church of people. Now, this doesn't mean that it's all based on whatever Israel does. So if Israel messes up, there won't be his people anymore. Okay, we know that's true from reading throughout the rest of the Bible. But this, these kind of conditional covenants uh, show us a couple of things. One, they show us that God requires obedience from people. Okay? So there are rewards for obeying, punishment for not obeying. So God requires obedience. We see that in these conditional covenants where there's something that God is giving them to do. Also, we see that Every time one of these covenants is given, you could probably, if you just flip a couple pages, you could probably find a place where Israel fails to obey what they're supposed to do. Okay, yeah, that's just how it works. God tells them to do something, and then they don't do it. And then, uh, so we see that God requires obedience, but that man consistently falls short. Now, this is where our first two things in the Old Testament kind of come together. Because God tells Israel they need to do these things, they end up falling and not doing it. Which leaves us, well, well now what do we do? See how that works, that question works? Well, the now what do we do is going to come in the New Testament. When we see that Jesus is going to become the ultimate uh, mediator for us. Flip back to Genesis 12. So we've got conditional covenants. We've also got, also got unconditional covenants. Okay. probably easily tell the difference between conditional covenants and unconditional covenants. This is 12 verses 1 through 3. Okay, this is Abraham back before his renamed, so we're talking to Abram. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house and the land I will show you, and I will make you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Okay, so this is, a, this is an example of an unconditional covenant. This is something that God is going to do because he wants to create people for himself. Okay? Abram, before this, had no particular, we don't see any really particular um, idea that Abram was anything special to know himself. God just said, all right, Abram, pick you. You're going to go over here. I'm going to make a nation. See, see the difference between those two? There's no like, hey Abram, if you leave your country and if you do all these things I tell you, then I'll make a great nation. No, Abram, I'm going to make a great nation. So you've got conditional covenants, unconditional covenants. And what do unconditional covenants show us? Unconditional covenants, covenants, yes, now show us that God is a gracious God who is faithful to those who He loves. Okay? So, We've got conditional covenants to where God requires obedience and we always fall short. We've got an unconditional covenant that's going to build the framework. This is kind of the theological framework for in the New Testament when, um, when God is, is just faithful to us regardless of all the things that we do. Uh, you can hear hints of this uh, saved by grace, not by works, right? And this, this is where this these. Uh, this is where these themes begin to emerge in the Old Testament, and, and they'll follow through to the New Testament. All right, so let me get my markers. Here's why we wanted to talk about covenants, all right? So covenants are usually given to, um, most of the time, covenants are given to one person, usually given to one man. So this covenant is given to Abram. Now, it, it affects a lot of other people, just one man. So you got a covenant that's given to Abram. you got covenants that are given to Noah. Covenants that are given to Moses. Covenants that are given to David. Okay? So basically, Alright, so God in the Old Testament makes a covenant with a representative. Okay? So God makes a covenant to, to a representative, and then the effects of that covenant flow out to everyone else. Does that make sense? So, for instance, in our Genesis 12 example. So, God makes a covenant. Who's the representative? Abram. Well, it's Abram first. 
Okay, and who's the who are the people that are going to feel the effects of this covenant? Well, it's all the families who will be blessed through Abel, right? And all the people who will be cursed if they curse Abel. That covenant effects flow out to all these people. Um, in our uh, Exodus example, right? Who does God give the covenant to in our Exodus example? Probably should give you some context. We're on Mount Sinai here. Moses, right? God gives the covenant to Moses. Who does the covenant affect fall to? Uh, falls to Israel. Okay? See how that works? This is how, this is how covenants are going to work. So you're going to get God speaking to a representative in the form of a covenant, and that's going to flow out into effects for other people. Okay, this is this is huge because what this is doing, right? If we can understand this and understand how the Old Testament co covenants work, when we get to the New Testament, right? We get to Jeremiah thirty-one, I think it is. We we'll talk about this new covenant. There's going to be a new. There's a new covenant that doesn't really get set to anyone yet, right? Then Jesus comes and right, we interpret uh, the Lord's Supper. This is the new covenant in my blood. Right? So when we get to the New Testament. Alright, we get to the New Testament, God gives the covenant. Well, who's the representative in the New Testament? This is where the sun's going to the Lord. Jesus, okay? Jesus is the representative. And who do the effects fall to? All those who would believe and repent, are repentant from the sin of the So, the church in the New Testament. Now, what's the difference between Abram and Abraham and Moses and these Old Testament representatives and Jesus. Without sin. Jesus is without sin. Okay? So in the Old Testament, God would give these covenants to these men, right? Especially, I mean, the big thing that when you think about David. I mean, if, if some of us did what David did, we'd be locked up for a couple years, you know what I mean? Um, you think about David. Man after God's own heart. That God gives this covenant to, and yet he falls tremendously, fails tremendously. Well, well, Jesus in the New Testament becomes this new representative who's a perfect representative of uh, this perfect representative for his people to God in a new covenant that works in a new way. Does that make sense? Following, these are one of the reasons why I wanted to. Kind of lay this out because in the Old Testament, almost everything seems to revolve around covenants. Okay, either you know the people, most of the people writing were people, these representatives. So Moses and you know, uh, David wrote a lot of the Old Testament. Uh, you see prophets <coughs> and give covenants sometimes. So this lays the foundation, and again, we'll talk about this more in a second. Does that make sense? So, as we're reading our Old Testament, we want to move through the Old Testament with the idea that God is operating through covenants, and that there's this coming Messiah that all these representatives seem to fall short of. So, if you get, you know, get the people get a judge, and the judge doesn't really judge fairly. You get a king, and the king doesn't really rule right here. The king falls. We're always looking forward to a new uh, person. We're always looking forward to Jesus, because we need a Messiah, we also need a new representative for us to be here to come. Yeah. All right. Any questions about that before we move on? Yeah. Um, again, these are not all the things in the Old Testament. Yeah. The Old Testament is very complex, really long. Yeah. In, in any long book, there are a lot of things. Yeah. Yeah. But these are just a couple basic ones that can kind of give you the right framework as you're, as you're working. Okay, so Old Testament themes. We've got the Old Testament theme of what coming Messiah, our promises made, and the Old Testament theme of covenants. Now we're going to move to the New Testament. So our Old Testament theme was that there is a coming Messiah. The New Testament theme is that there is a Messiah who has come. So the Gospels kind of give us a bird's eye view into that Messiah coming, and then all the rest of the New Testament is interpreting for us what we should believe about that Messiah who, who came, and what should we do now that the Messiah has come. Okay? 
So the New Testament uh, should be this idea of uh, a promise kept. Okay, so as you're reading through, um, you read through, you get to Luke 24. And Jesus is saying, all that stuff in the Old Testament, those promises that were made to you, those were about me. You start reading some of Paul's writing, he's going to connect dots for us from the Old Testament about, you read Romans, literally read Romans 2 through, or Romans 1 through 9, 10, you're going to get all this stuff about how the new covenant applies to Israel. Well, why is that important if it's a completely new covenant? Well, because all this stuff in the Old Testament, all these covenants and this, this people um, were pointing towards what Christ was coming to do. So we've got the promise made, promise kept, and then we've got a new covenant people. That's, a new, that's another thing. And uh, let's move this. Everybody got this? All right. So we're going to make a comparison here. So we've got the Old Testament here. We'll do the New Testament over here. Okay, so the Old Testament. Let's say you're a person in the Old Testament. Okay, the Old Testament. How do you how would you relate to God in the Old Testament? Okay? God is here. How would you relate? Okay? Go ahead. Through the priest. Okay, through the priest. Process. Yep. So you would get you would go to God through a priest. Another guy over here. Who would make sacrifices of little cows or livestock. Right? And through that priest, you would get back up to God. Right? Again, another thing, those sacrifices point to the fact that sin costs something, that there's a requirement that price has to be paid for sin. You look at Deuteronomy, and it talks, it's kind of graphic, it talks about blood, a reckoning, blood, it's kind of, PG-13, you watch that movie. But, there's got to be bloodshed to reconcile us back to God. What other ways would you know how this? How do Old Testament people hear from God? Good prophets. Prophets. There you go. Prophets. So you got God speaking to the prophets who speak to the people. Jesus, uh, little prophet. Here. That's kind of the, uh, what is the weather pattern called? The cycle. Right? So <laughs> God speaks to the prophets, the prophets talk to the people. People have to go to the priest to make sacrifices, and that gets them back to God. Okay? That's the Old Testament. The New Testament, I this, these are the Old, old Testament, Old Covenant. Use the New Testament, we're talking about New Covenant people. Okay? The way we relate with God is fundamentally different to the way the Old Testament did. Now, it's similar, and the, all the pieces are still the same, but it's different. So, we'll go with Christ. Really new, new covenant. You love Christ. Okay. So, we got God up here. Ah, terrible. Yeah, we're going back to that. Just trying to make a point. Alright. So, we're talking about God. Alright, this is. Guy in New Testament time, or us today. Okay? How do we hear from God? Okay, well, we hear from God through His Word, right? But ultimately, who is our prophet? Jesus. Jesus, right? Okay. Jesus is the perfect prophet. Why is that? Well, Prophets in the Old Testament, again, were sinful, fallen people who struggled and a lot of times did things like Jonah when he ran away from God. Come on, man. Are you serious? Mm -hmm. it's ridiculous. Jesus never did that, right? Jesus perfectly fulfilled uh, all of his prophetic responsibilities and he was our prophet. Okay? So we hear through the word. So the words from God come from Jesus. Why is that? Well, John 1, Jesus is the word. That's how we hear from God. Okay? Well, Jesus is also the new covenant priest. 
How so? Jesus doesn't slay animals for me on a day that is this. No, he was our sacrifice. He was our sacrifice. So these two guys right here all become one. So Jesus is the priest who, who offered up the sacrifice. No one takes my life from me. I give it of my own accord. He's also the sacrifice. He is the spotless lamb of God who was slain on our behalf so that we can be spreading to to God. Side note, a lot of times when you hear Jesus filling a role as a prophet and priest, you'll also hear him fulfill the role as a king. As a prophet, priest, and king. Those are kind of the three. And then it says the prophet, priest, and king. You'll find those, uh, you'll find those kind of themes flowing through. And part of the reason for that is People in the Old Testament, so you think they're in David's time, were ruled by a king, King David. But King David also went on to deep it for a while. He's not a perfect king. Christ is a perfect king. That rule. So, in the New Testament, right, we just go directly through Christ to get to God. So as we're reading the uh, as we're reading the New Testament, you gotta keep in mind that. There's two separate, two different types of ways of relating with God. They're similar and they have the same pieces. But again, as we're reading, we're thinking of Christ being the fulfillment of the Old Testament. Right? What, a better, what better proof of that he would be our prophet and our priest and king? Does that make sense? Again, there are people much smarter than me, but much better than me, and have written humongous books about it. But this is the basics of what we're talking about. Just let me know when we're too bad. Okay. Any questions about these couple things we've talked about today? Okay, these hopefully these will help uh, as we're studying to make sure that we don't get too far off track. Okay, I don't want any of the uh, sacrifice goats out in here. All right, let's get a, a head start on the genres for this week. And next week we'll dive into more in depth to some of these genres. Um, first question, why do you think we should study genres? What's the point of studying genres? Do you want to know what a genre is? I, I looked up the definition, so <laughs> please don't feel embarrassed. I'm going to give you the a genre is a category of composition, so it can be in music, literature, obviously we're talking about literature, characterized by similarities in form, style, or subject matter. Okay? So if you go to the bookstore and you buy a book with poems, all right, don't expect to find all the twists in your book of poems. It's completely different. Job. It's not a book. Okay? So you're going to get this book of poems. It's going to have all poems in it. How are you going to know if they're all poems? Because they all have similar composition, similar theme, kind of subject matter, and they're gonna be they're gonna be roughly similar. So the reason why we should study genres, the point of studying genres is that if we get a grasp on genres, they help us un they help make our interpretation a lot easier. Because genres for us, all intents and purposes when we're speaking, have similar subject matter in that they talk about similar things and then they can be interpreted in similar ways, okay? So when you're reading the Pentateuch, for the first five books of the Old Testament, right? They're written by the same author, and they have similar themes in that they're talking about kind of similar stuff, so that as you're going to interpret them, you can roughly say you can interpret Deuteronomy and Numbers in the same way, okay? You can't say I can interpret Deuteronomy and Mark in the same way. Okay, they're, they're different jobs. Same way with the Gospels. Okay? You can interpret the Gospels roughly the same. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, really the same. John's going to be a little different, but most most time you can interpret them the same way. But you can't really interpret Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John the same way as you can interpret Zechariah. Okay? Because they're different jobs. They give you good starting points, is the reason why we want to study. And they have different characteristics that we have to look out for so that we don't misinterpret them. Okay? Because a lot of times, most bad teaching comes from, comes from 
taking a verse and not understanding where it fits, what genre it's in, how to interpret it, pulling it out and just dropping it somewhere, trying to interpret it to make it say what you want it to say. So we're going to be looking at genres for that first piece. Okay, I'm going to run through, I'm going to have this, yeah, wait a minute, so you're going to get a chance to print this out. I'm going to have this printed out for you guys next week. Um, I've got a chart of kind of what books fall into what rough genres. Um, and I'll have that for you next week. I've got it here with me. Um, but to kind of run down very quickly, you've got historical law and narrative books. Okay. These are your books in the Old Testament. Uh, a majority of your Old Testament books are going to fall into this category. These are the books that are going to give either Old Testament commandments, laws, or just the story of Israel. Okay. You're going to get that. You've got wisdom literature. You can find those in Job, the Proverbs, and Ecclesiastes. Okay, and you're gonna you're gonna go on and you're gonna read Ecclesiastes and you're like, wisdom literature. That just makes no sense. Alright? So that's wisdom literature, those those can be interpreted similarly. You've got poetry in the Old Testament. Alright, so you can be thankful for your 10th grade English teacher who made you read all those ridiculous poems. Because we're gonna be looking at poetry. Find those in the Psalms. Um, Song of Solomon and Lamentations. You've got books of prophecy. Okay, these are books uh, in the Old Testament that are kind of prophetic books pointing towards Christ, uh, pointing towards the Christ to come. The most common one you would know of this would be Isaiah, right? where Isaiah is always talking about this random, vague person, this coming king or this suffering servant. Who's he talking about? It doesn't look like those two can be the same. Um, but we got prophetic books. Uh, you've got my favorite genre. You've got apocalyptic books. Okay? Just kidding. Those are the most difficult ones to hear. You're going to find uh, Daniel is one of those, and then Revelation is one of those. Okay? That's, that's a genre that's got one in the Old, one in the New Testament. Most genres kind of stay within Testament scope. Um, uh, apocalyptic is the outlier to that. You've got gospel books Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I'd always, I would also throw Acts into there. Because it's a, it's a narrative gospel right after the life of Christ. So it's be, you can interpret this that way. And then you've got the epistles. This is the majority of your New Testament. Letters written to people about certain things, certain subjects, certain things. So we're going to be going through those. i, I got to figure out how I'm going to break it up. I have to kind of depend on how long it takes to go. We'll just kind of go to where we're at. But we're going to go through each of those in depth. Each of those have a unique. Um, Unique way of interpreting them. So we're going to go through those and try that out a little bit. So that's kind of the broad, uh, broad scope of what we're going to be doing in um, in studying genres. So again, we've got 66 books. What we're trying to do to make it a little easier to interpret is that we're going to take and compartmentalize them a little bit so that we have kind of rule uh, guidelines that we want to follow as we interpret each time. Okay, this is kind of like. If you're reading, I'm trying to think of a book off the top of my head that says this. So, Crime and Punishment, for instance. We've got part one. Right? Part one tells a story. And then at the end of part one, you get to part two. And so you can stop and say, okay, what did part one want to really tell you about? In the same way, kind of, we're going to break these up so you can say, okay, I'm going to read, as I'm reading all these all this historical law and narrative books, what are they trying to tell me? How can I interpret it? Does that make sense? All right, any questions? Yeah, I think we'll leave it there for this week. Uh, we'll get rid of that. Any questions about anything we talked about today? Covenants. Promises made, promises kept. New covenant people. Mystic drawings. Mm -hmm. Time.